farming as an industry, when you step back from it, is this unbelievably damaging thing that we are doing to planet Earth. George, thanks for joining us. So you say in the book, farming is the most destructive human activity ever to have blighted the earth. Um, and people might be a bit shocked by that. So can we start with that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's something people really don't want to hear because you know, obviously we need farming. We're totally dependent on farming. Um, and it's surrounded by all these sort of comforting myths and the the stories for very young children all about this lovely livestock farm where there's one horse and one cow and one pig and one cat and one dog all living in harmony and that's how we like to see it but the reality is it's the greatest cause of habitat destruction the greatest cause of biodiversity loss the greatest cause of extinction one of the greatest causes of climate breakdown of freshwater pollution of marine pollution also major cause actually of, of air pollution we don't think about that very often um, major cause of soil loss uh, major cause of of water use um, the, the list goes on and on um, yeah and and you know it is amazing how little it features in our environmental consciousness we talk about transport we talk about home insulation we talk about industry and yet somehow we don't want to go there why is that I think it arises from these sort of very deeply implanted, well, root metaphors, as the cognitive historian Jeremy Lent calls them, which is this: um, these ideas which have sunk so deep into the sort of fabric of our being that we, we don't even see them as ideas a- anymore. They're, they're just, this is the way the world is. And 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 you could trace it. I mean, one line of thought would trace it back to the pastoral poetry, which was originally conceived by the ancient Greeks and then picked up by the Romans, and then in the Renaissance um, here in Europe and in in, in the in, in England in particular, um, and then gets picked up by those children's books, but also by like Sunday night TV. And 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 what it says is is the countryside and farming is the seat of innocence and purity and the city is evil and corrupt it's a seething cauldron of corruption and if you want to get away from all that you go into the countryside and there you see farmers at peace with the land living in harmony and the rest of it and this is this is a story which has been told again and again and again and it's embedded itself but you know it's it's not actually true <laughs> and um, and while Obviously, farming is essential, and there are many good farmers who are absolutely doing their best. Farming as an industry, when you step back from it, is this unbelievably damaging thing that we are doing to planet Earth. Something I hear a lot is that um, oh, if you eat free-range eggs or pasture-fed beef, mm. uh, that's okay. Um, but that's not the case, is it? It really isn't. In fact, one of the shocking findings when researching the book was that possibly the most damaging of all farm products is organic pasture fed beef and um and and the more free range something is the more damage it's likely to be doing so in the case of beef you've got several factors there one is the sheer amount of land you need to to maintain or produce that that organic pasture fed beef um and the more land is used for agriculture or for any extractive industry, the less is available for forests, for wetlands, for savannas, for the other wild ecosystems required to sustain uh, biodiversity and prevent um, the sixth great extinction. Um, and and so when people say they hate intensive farming and they want it to be more extensive, that means you're using more land to produce the same amount of food. And land use should be our crucial environmental metric. You know, we, we should be constantly aware of how much land we're using. We're aware of how much pollution we're making and how much carbon dioxide we're producing and the rest, but it's how much land you're using is absolutely crucially important in determining whether Earth systems are going to survive or not. Um, but then there's also the fact that um, organic pasture-fed animals take longer to grow. They produce more nitrous oxide um, um, in their dung, more methane altogether, um, the, the, the general load on the planet is, is that much greater. Um, the same applies to free-range chickens. Um, when they're outdoors, obviously it's kinder to the chicken, um, but they're laying down dung on, in really intense quantities on the ground that gets washed off into the rivers. Um, they use more energy, so they need more feed. Um, they need more land, obviously. Uh, so none of these things are, so to speak, a free lunch. Okay, so look, the, 
the first half of your book, I think, will really shock people uh, and challenge them, and it should. Um, but but the second half is, you know, if not more important, really, because it offers a vision, doesn't it? It offers mm. solutions and hope. So uh, let's have some of that now, please. Yeah. So 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 I look at the ways in which we can produce the sort of three main categories of food, really, which is um, 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 our, our staple crops, mostly grains, um, though not exclusively, fruit and vegetables and protein and fat. And, um, and, and in all cases, there are potential uh, transformative solutions to some of the huge environmental, social, economic problems now associated with our food supply. And um, the biggest, I suppose, the one which makes the biggest difference of all is basically taking protein and fat production out of farming altogether and and producing those essential elements of our diet through precision fermentation. In other words, mm. through brewing, brewing microbes in factories. Now, obviously, a lot of people are horrified by this prospect, but I, I think if it were the other way around, if you know, we're already doing it that way, and someone said, no, 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 we're going to scrap all that. I know we'll go and get it from animals instead. And we'll round up loads of them and domesticate them and, and breed them in huge numbers and kill 75 billion of them a year and introduce pandemics into the human population and destroy vast tracts of the planet to do so and all the rest of it. They'd be absolutely horrified. Yeah. And and this you know, precision fermentation uses a tiny fraction of the land, a tiny fraction of the resources, the materials, um, to uh, produce basically anything you want and uh, eventually you know any protein any fat in any combination not just to substitute the meat and milk that we currently eat today but to produce a whole range of products we never even thought of just mm. as the first people to domesticate a cow we're never thinking of camembert you know there's, there's endless possibilities begin to arise so that's that's one area there's also in in terms of um, arable crops, I've become very interested indeed in switching from annual crops to perennial crops and mm. follow the work of the Land Institute in Kansas, which has been developing a whole range of perennial cereal grains, perennial oil crops, eventually perennial beans, we hope, um, which all could potentially greatly reduce the impact because you don't have to plough the land every year and 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 get those crops started again every year, which requires often a lot of agrochemicals and stuff. You could you could greatly reduce impacts that way. This is very exciting. I've eaten some of their products; they're fantastic. So there's potential there. But then, perhaps most revolutionary of all, is um, the work of this um, remarkable vegetable grower, um, Ian Tolhurst or Tolly, who yeah. has effectively anticipated the latest developments in soil ecology by about 20 years and <laughs> and worked out that by tweaking the relationship between plants, bacteria and fungi, you can actually greatly raise the fertility of your soil without fertilizer or manure. And um, and he now farming on really rubbish soil, um, grade three B for those in the know, um, is is hitting the lower bound of conventional yields on good soil um, without fertilizers or manure. It's quite a remarkable thing, and and it, you know it's not easy to replicate, but it gives us a, a pointer as to where we could potentially begin to take things. Talking of farmers, right? So I, I was reading Farmers Weekly just before I had a chat with you, uh, and I saw in there that they, they've got a campaign around um, workplace fatalities because mm. you know farming has the highest number of workplace fatalities of all occupations, mm. and and you know it's also got this awful problem with suicide, yeah. um, and farmers are really up against it, aren't mm. they? And what, so mm. what are they going to think of your book, and and how do we bring them along? Well, the thing is that farmers tell a story about themselves, which uh, bears no relation to reality. They say, oh, we're totally unadaptable. We can't change. We've always done this thing and we we always will. It's impossible for us to do anything else. And, you know, when I actually look at farmers, they're among the most resourceful and resilient people of all. They're highly adaptable and they will follow where the money takes them. And they're very good at doing that. And I've had Sheep farmers in Wales say, oh, no, I, I, we've always done it this way. I can never change. And the next thing you know, they've signed a contract with some vast multinational to build a huge chicken factory yeah. on, on their farm. And, and it's like, yeah, because yeah, they follow the money, which is fair enough. You have to survive. And so let's change the incentives. And the great tool we've got at our disposal is the fact that the world is spending between $500 billion and $600 billion a year 
on farm subsidies, most of which are completely destructive. They're, they, they're totally perverse. They favour the biggest um, owners with the most money. Um, they uh, uh, often raise food prices in, in, in many cases, and they are generally very environmentally damaging. Um, let's change the incentives to to actually pay people to do good things for ecological restoration, um, to switch towards um, uh, farming, which is both high yield and low impact, which is the holy grail, really, which is what I'm aiming at with farming in this book is say, you know, low yield farming is a disaster, just as high impact farming is a disaster, because low yield means high impact, because it means you're using a great deal of land. So somehow we have to bring together high yields, highly productive farming with the lowest possible impacts. And there are ways beginning to emerge of doing that. I wonder if we need a, a kind of IPCC for farming or agriculture mm. in order to really get this message out rather than mm. just having to rely on, you know, books like yours, yeah. um, but to, to do it more systematically. And because, you know, that's what we need. And also because, mm. You know, people are very sensitive about criticism over what they eat, mm. aren't they? Yeah. Um, so, you know, how do we bring them along? Well, there is a sort of group like that, which is the IAASTD. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, they, all these things, they trip off the tag, don't they? Yeah. They're so user friendly. Um, um, and, and, you know, it's done some great work. Um, there are lots of people doing great work, but it's not really penetrating public consciousness. And this is mm. the fundamental problem. You know, a lot of the really big issues in the academic literature just aren't reaching us at all. And I see scientists just banging their heads against the wall saying, for God's sake, people, listen, listen to mm. this. It's so important and just not getting the traction. So th there isn't an easy formula here. You know, there's, there's enormous resistance within the media to hearing this change, within industry um, to, 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 to hearing these calls for change. Um, and we just have to use every medium at our disposal, which is why I'm so grateful to be on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great to have you. I mean, it's similar to with the with the biodiversity crisis more generally, isn't it? That doesn't get, I mean, you hear people complaining that that's not treated as seriously as the climate crisis is starting to be treated yeah. a bit, a bit yeah. more seriously. It's so true, you know, and, and, and partly because of that, a lot of the climate solutions we, we propose actually are quite damaging for biodiversity and for, mm. for, for other earth systems. And we're not looking at the picture as a whole. I think part of the issue there is that, um, you know, climate is, the numbers are quite simple. You know, um, I mean, it's not simple, simple, but, you know, this amount of CO2 causes this amount of radiative forcing, which causes this amount of heating. If you um, burn this amount of fossil fuel, this is the outcome. If you reduce it, this is the outcome. And you've got a sort of fairly um, a simple set of, of, of linear numbers which attach to each other. Whereas when you're talking about biodiversity, when you're talking about farming, you're talking about a tremendous set of interacting complex systems um, which um, don't give you such simple numbers and such simple answers. I mean, we absolutely need to extract the answers. We need to find the numbers. And I want people to become food numerate. That's one of the, the, the calls in this book. You know, it's not enough to just do all this hand waving and say, oh, you know, I like the look of this system, you know, cows grazing in the field surrounded by buttercups. You know, we, we have to have the numbers. And, and I've tried to fill in a few of those gaps, but, it, you know, you're just scraping the surface. You know, I feel, you know, I know just a fraction of what I want to know. Another thing that gives me hope is the the rise of things like Meat Free Mondays and Veganuary mm. and, mm. Uh, you know, VB6, v Vegan Before Six. Um, yeah. So it is starting to get in there. But and, and, and I think you talk about in the book as well about how it doesn't need that much of a minority mm. Uh, to to start to really affect change, so yeah. I think we can see the the snowball growing. We just mm. need to push it a bit harder. So there is this very interesting research, both um, observational and experimental, suggesting that human society, just like all complex systems, has tipping points, um, and and so you'll get sort of gradual, often imperceptible change, and then suddenly crosses a, a, a critical threshold and it flips into a different equilibrium, and um, and and what. Uh, the sort of average figure emerging from that work suggests is you need a penetration of about 25%. Once you've got 25% of people on board with your new way of looking at the world, then suddenly the rest, uh, uh, other people look around and say, oh, status quo has changed. Um, the wind is blowing in a different direction and they swing around to catch it. And yeah. and then you get this sort of sudden sort of domino effect where everything 
just flips in, into a different state of being. And that's happened um, in, in, in many other situations. If you think of um, um, gay, gay marriage, for example, you know, it was considered utterly outrageous and unacceptable a generation ago. And suddenly it's just, oh, yeah, well, of course, why not? You know, yeah. it would be ridiculous not to, you know, and, and it's um, and, and those flips can happen very quickly indeed. And we just have to keep pushing and pushing and hopefully reach that critical mass. Fantastic. 